we have some adults in our congregation that are just like Asher. They are brand new to Jesus. They're, they're brand new. We had five or six Sunday. They're, they're brand new to Jesus. They don't know anything. All they want's milk. All they want's mama. They're, they're brand spanking new. Do you remember what that was like? I mean, when you first came to Jesus and you thought you maybe knew something, then you found out you don't know anything. And people nurtured you and brought you along. And, you know, pastors and teachers, people, they started feeding you the word of God. Remember? And you started growing up. And you were acting like a bunch of three-year-olds at one time. And so the, all this stuff, and then finally you started figuring out, hey, I, I can feed myself. I can get my own snacks. I don't have to wait for mom to fix it, Pastor Bill to fix it. I can get my own snack. I make my own peanut butter and jelly sandwich right here. Peanut butter and honey. It would be a peanut butter and honey sandwich. That's what I'm talking about. And then you grow up some more and find out, you know what? I can cook my own barbecue. I can, I can put it together. I'm talking about the word of God. And then you figure out you can start sharing it with people. And people get excited about that. Then you find out that then there's a point in time where the Holy Spirit enables you, overwhelms you. And you didn't even know you could do that. We're going to talk about that some on Sunday. That's a commercial. I hope you got it. Well, no, Labor Day, we're not. Well, I'm going to be here on Labor Day. So I expect you guys to be here as we grow as a family. And people are getting saved. You say, well, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm, it's a setup for Proverbs chapter 14 tonight, but I want you to go to John. Take your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 14. John 14, I know you know the passage, but I need to remind you of John 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1. So if you have a Bible, it's right there at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, find chapter 14. In verse 1, if you guys could stand with me as we read the Word of God together. Jesus, this is the night before he died. He's just hours from the cross. He's in the upper room with the, with the disciples. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I got to give you a commercial, okay? I just, I didn't know I'd do this, but I'm going to break right there. We're going to be talking about that Sunday. That's a prophecy right there. It's a prophecy. He promises he's going to come and get us. I didn't say it. Does Jesus keep his word? Do all the prophecies of the Bible come true? Yes. I'll show you some Sunday in Acts chapter 2 that came true. Yes. And you say, why does that matter to us? <laughs> because the rest are going to come true too. Right. Soon. Right. You can't say that. I'll say it again. Soon. Yes. I go to prepare a place for you. Thank you, Jesus. I'll come again. Thank you, Jesus. Receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Can I hear you say the way? The way. See, the problem with the way, it shows up twice in Proverbs. We'll see it tonight. Every person on planet Earth thinks they're in the right way. Everybody. They all think they're in the right way. They're in the right religion, the right country, the right culture, the right family, the right church. Everybody thinks I'm in the right way. Everybody thinks that. And if God doesn't open up your eyes in a revelation about Jesus, you're deceived. We're going to see that in Proverbs twice. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Everybody thinks they're in the right way. Jesus said, and where you go, you know, and the way you know. 
Thomas raised his hand. <laughs> I see that. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. Can I hear you say the way? The way. He didn't say I am a way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus, you can't say that. That's narrow-minded. Jesus could say because he's the son of God. Jesus can say because he's about to die so that you can be in the way. Jesus is going to pay the price for your sins and my sins. He's the substitute. He is the way. And in him, then we are in the way. If we're not, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Let me say it a different way. If you're not in Jesus, you're headed for hell. You're headed for death and you don't even know it. That's why Jesus comes along and says, hey, <laughs> let me open up your eyes. Let me give you my spirit. Let me tell you the word. And you say, when's he start doing that? From the nursery Amen. with songs that you don't think means anything except the Lord uses that and all the way through. And then all of a sudden there's a point in time where you decide, I need to, I need to follow Jesus. And he really is the way. And once you're in that way, everything changes. You're not even going the same direction. You're not in charge of your life anymore. You're in Jesus and you're in the way, the truth, and the life. Then all of a sudden, you can understand Proverbs. If you don't have Jesus, you can't understand Proverbs. You'll still think you can keep the Bible somehow. You think you can get better somehow. You think somehow you can earn your way. No. The only way you can understand Proverbs is if you're in Jesus, you're in the way. Your heart changes, and now you can see how to make that way better in Jesus. Right. Amen? Amen? What are you going to talk about tonight? One way, Jesus. Yeah. One way, Jesus. There's just one way. Oh, that's an old hippie thing. Well, this old hippie kind of want to be. <laughs> it's true. Yes. It's absolutely true. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Proverbs chapter 14. Thank you for John and chapter 14, especially verse 6. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Thank you. If nobody here, Lord, if anybody here, if anybody here is not in the person of Christ, I pray tonight would be a time for them to hear your Holy Spirit, to hear your word, to hear you calling them by name. It'd be a great night to follow Jesus. And all of God's people would say, Amen. hey, greet somebody around you. Welcome them to, to church tonight. So open your Bibles, <clears throat> open your Bibles with me, right, pretty much right to the middle of your Bible. If you open your Bible, pretty much the middle, you're going to be in Proverbs chapter 14. We're in Proverbs 14 tonight. We're going to walk through, I, I think we're going to make it through 19 verses. And uh, I actually titled it One Way Jesus. And you say, where'd you get that title? Well, I got it from John 14, but I got it from Proverbs 14 too. And look with me, just jumping ahead a little bit. Proverbs 14, verse 12. Look at Proverbs 14, verse 12. There it is, way back there in the Old Testament. There is a way, not the way, there is a way that seems right to a man. He actually thinks it's the right way. But its end is a way of death. Is that what your Bible say? They make it up. That, that same verse will be repeated in chapter 16, verse 25. In case you missed it reading through Proverbs, it's going to show up again. You say, what's that mean? Everybody thinks they're in the right way. 
Everybody thinks if I light enough candles, I'll go to heaven. If I give enough money, I'll go to heaven. If I try to keep the Bible, I'll go to heaven. If I have Jesus on a cross around my, I'll go to heaven. If I say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll go to heaven. If I bow down before a little fat guy with his hands up in the air, I'll go to heaven. If I cut myself and bleed, I'll go to heaven. If I get incense and run around and just wave it, if I sing enough worship songs, if I join Grace Church, which, by the way, we don't have membership, but if you did, that wouldn't make any difference at all. None. And yet religion runs on that. Religion does. Jesus comes and says, I want to give you a relationship. I'll pay the price for you. But I'm the way and the truth. And the life. Somewhere you have to switch being on the wrong way, and you say, What's the wrong way? Whatever way you were on before you came to Jesus. They're all wrong. Some are more obvious than others, but they're all wrong, and they all end in death. Aren't you glad you know Jesus? And that you can understand the full counsel when you're a brand new little baby in Christ. And as you grow up, you get older and older and older. And you're more convinced than ever, it's Jesus, it's grace, it's mercy. It's not what I do. It's who I'm in. It's everything. And then what I do helps the process of life in Amarillo, helps the process of being a witness before him. It doesn't help my salvation. I'm secure in Christ. It helps my sanctification that I should be looking like Jesus after 50 years. Oh, come on, Bill, you've always been nice. (laughs) Ask my brother. It comes up in this chapter a little bit. So uh, chapter 14, back to the one-way Jesus. We read, catching up here, verse 1. Excuse me. The wise woman. The wise woman builds her house. Uh, Teresa, I just thought of you because you actually built your house. This lady's a pioneer woman. She built it. She built her house. The plumbing, the electric, the foundation, the walls, that lady right there. And the Bible would say, you're a wise woman. (laughs) Can I see the quote by Clark, please? I've got a quote by, by Clark. By prudent and industrious management, the wise woman, she increases property in the family furniture in the house and food and raiment for her household. This is the true building of a house. The thriftless wife acts differently and the opposite is the result. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Who would do that? Foolish women. Can I see the quote by Bridges, please? Note the foolish woman. Her idleness, her waste, her love of pleasure, her lack of forethought and care. We see her house torn down in confusion. It would have been a sad result if this had been done by the enemy and enemy. But it is the doing, or rather the undoing, of her own hands. It's her house, ladies. Have you turned it into a home? Have you built your own house? So what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you about Cindy. She'd be mad, but I don't care. It's all true. I mean, we, we were kids when we got married. We had nothing. I made $50 a week being a youth pastor. Woohoo! <laughs> Even back in the 70s, that ain't a lot of money. Where can you find a place for 50 bucks a week? You can. So this farmer in Cindy's church had this old ranch house, two-story Green Acre house. Whatever Green Acres, it was that. Cows lived in our yard. The birds lived in the second floor. It, it, it barely had electricity. Nobody would live in it except a poor youth pastor and a crazy wife, a wise woman. 
And she fixed it up and put stuff together. It was so bad. It was so bad. But she made it into a home. And we only had to stay there for like three months. But for three months, I don't remember all the junk. I remember the stuff that Cindy helped fix up. And then we bought a trailer. A 12, let me see, it was a 12 by 60. A guy lived in it for three or four years that had lost his mind, couldn't take care of himself. It made the two-story Green Acre house. And Cindy, once again, a lot of elbow grease, a lot of cleaning. The refrigerator was so bad, so bad. I put it on the back of my truck and I took it to a car wash. And I thought, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, throw it away. We had that same refrigerator when we sold that trailer five years later. And you say, what'd you do to it? Now, it wasn't just Cindy, but I'm just saying, she put all the stuff, all the things, and all, you know, the paper in the cupboards and all that, she just took over. What happened? We were able to sell that trailer for $5,500. Do the math. Bought it for $600. Who? Who gets that credit? Cindy, a wise woman. So we moved to Amarillo by morning. We still, you know, my, my first job in Amarillo, they still thought, well, just give them the bare bones. It was more than 50 bucks. But how, how are you going to live? How are you going to buy a house? And we looked and looked and looked and looked. And we looked and looked and looked and looked. And I, I finally gave up. And then finally God gave us a house. This is back when interest rates was 14.5%. So if you're complaining about seven, eight, nine percent, it ain't nothing. Try buying a house making fourteen thousand dollars a year with fourteen and a half percent. God works some stuff, work some stuff. The only problem with the house we had at West Eleventh, the whole thing was a dump, once again, and everything inside was pink, ugly pink. The carpet, the walls, the bathtub. I, I think the bathtub was. I don't remember. But everything was pink. Every, it was a, it was a wreck, but not to Cindy. Not to Cindy. And we spent, I don't know, four or five years fixing up another piece of junk. And then finally after that, you add it all together, we were able to buy a normal house. By this time, we have three babies. A normal house. And you know what Cindy did? The same thing she did to one, two, three. She fixed it up. She made it a home. So ladies, I'm going to come inspect your house. No, 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 no. (laughs) I've been in many, many houses, and it's beautiful to see, it's beautiful to see when women that are wise make it into a home. Amen? Verse 2. He who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. But he who is perverse in his ways despises him. Can I see Ephesians 2, 8 through 10? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you're saved, you have the righteousness of Christ. You're in the way. But you have these good works, these things that you can now do. And wisdom would say, he who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. You're already upright. You're already righteous in him. When you walk in that, when you're in the way of the way you walk in that, you fear the Lord. The perverse is in his ways, despises him. In other words, cooperate with the Lord and walk in that path. Amen? Verse 3, in the mouth of a fool, in the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride. In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride. But the lips of the wise will preserve them, rescue them. Wait, we got somebody... That's a fool in his mouth is this rod of pride. And yet the words, the lips of the wise, you don't want to be the fool. You want to be 
the wise and the words, the lips of the wise, well, that, that's actually going to rescue us. But what says the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride. Can I see Proverbs 10, 13? We saw this before. Proverbs 10, 13. <clears throat> Wisdom is found, wisdom is found on the lips, the words. Wisdom is found on the lips of him who has understanding. But a rod is for the back of him who is devoid of understanding. What's that talk? There's a rod of correction. Wisdom is found on the lips if you have understanding. You know about Jesus. You know what you're supposed to do. Your, your, your words are special. But there's a rod, there's correction, there's chastisement is for the back of him who is devoid of understanding. In other words, your, your words are going to get you in trouble. If you don't know Jesus, they're going to get you in trouble. And then you're going to be corrected. All different kinds of ways that happens. But you can figure out who's the wise with words of wisdom or who's the fool that's just talking. And he doesn't make any sense. He's gonna, there's a rod of correction. So we go back to verse 3 of chapter 14. Can I, can I see the uh, quote by Walkie, please? The fool's pride, the fool's pride finds a rod in his mouth that lashes himself. He is his own worst enemy and others. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I'm still learning that. Because if you talk too quick, it might be out of pride. And you're going to end up lashing yourself. Amen. Amen. Translated, think before you speak. And then it's probably okay to ask this question. Is it necessary for me to even speak? You know who is the best at that? Jesus. I think you get the point. In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride. Don't want to be that guy. But the lips of the wise will rescue, preserve them. Oh, here's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. There it is coming up right here. <laughs> Bang! Where no oxen are, the trough, the manger, the stable, the stall. Where there are no oxen, the stall is clean. Yes. But much increase comes by the strength of an ox. You want increase? You want fruit? You want success? You better find an ox. Oh, we don't want any oxes. They're too messy. You have no idea. You don't want a tractor to pull your plow? You don't want to have somebody grind your wheat? You don't want to be an increase? You're, you're so caught up in being clean? You don't want to be messy? No, look at the manger's clean. The stall's clean. We just got it sterilized. Sterilized? I think you're so clean, you're not going to get anything done. Because guess what? Life and church and Jesus is messy. No, we just want everything to be in order and nothing to be out of. Whoa, 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 whoa. Do you see what that's saying? Where there's no oxen, well, you got a clean trough, you got a manger, that's stall that's clean, but... Much increase comes by the strength of an ox. In other words, it's worth the mess. The slobber on the manger, clean it up. The straw scattered, clean it up. The, I'll just say poo-poo. 
That means something's happening. If it doesn't get messed up, you know, you people, you're always making a mess. We have to have janitors come in after you, and there's stuff all over. You know, just don't come back Sunday, and then we don't have to clean it up. No, it's worth the mess. I'm quoting this verse all the time to our janitors, that people take care of it. There's Joyce. She's one of them. All the time. I praise God. It's dirty. Job security. I guarantee when they're all done here, you'll have to come back to them tomorrow and kind of put it all back in order. But it's not just talking about the mess that oxes make. You can get so careful about making sure everything's in order that nothing ever gets out of order for you to set it back into order. Did you just hear what I said? You can get to where like, I don't want anything to go wrong. I don't want anything to get messed up. We're not going to change anything. Stop it. No oxes here. Well, you're not going to grow. You're not going to increase. Can I, let me make sure I got the right guy here. The, the quote by Guzik. Can I see Guzik? It is important. It's an important principle when it comes to church life and Christian community. There are some who, out of good intentions, are obsessed with making sure that there's never any kind of mess to address among believers. Each and every expression of spiritual life must be hyper-regulated and suspiciously watched with the expectation of grave error. Don't you guys mess up on me. Don't you do it. Ha! Huh. Not only is this offensive against Christian liberty, but it also creates an environment where, spiritually speaking, there is little increase because no one will tolerate any mess in the trough. It's a true story. In, in my church, in this town, back when I was the youth pastor, it's now a funeral home, thank you, but before it was a funeral home, it was a great little building, perfect little place, everything squeaky clean. I'm not in charge. But they put new carpet in, in that building. And they did not want the teenagers walking through the sanctuary. You keep the kids out in their building, not our building. Huh. Are you afraid of all those little oxes? That's the future of the church. They actually made them come in the back door, back in through the kitchen to come in. Don't, don't, don't mess up the sanctuary. Huh? I was the youth pastor. There's a lady in that church. I love her in the Lord. She's now with the Lord. She had an immaculate house and she wanted to have, you know, open house for the ladies in the church. But she cleaned out her garage so the youth group would not come into her house. What? Who are you? No messes here. In case you don't know it, you walked into a messy church in many different ways. Now, I hope it was clean. I hope the bathrooms were clean. I hope the room was clean. It feels about like the right temperature for me. Thank you. But when you leave, oh, you're talking physical. No, I'm talking all kinds of messes. There's all kinds of messes. That we take all kinds of chances. Is that chances on what? Trunk or treat. Do you know what that is? One big mess. <laughs> and thousands of people come. Why? Because it's fun. There's an increase. How big a mess is it? Oh, it's a big old mess. Some messes are really, really big. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, I love that little, perfect little building where nobody could mess up. Went to a, a lock shop, a gas station. 17 of us started Grace Church. You know what it was? It's messy. We had to do stuff that we'd never tried before. It was fun. Did you clean up the We cleaned up the messes. We tried new things, and it increased. Where'd you go from there? The YWCO. If you've been down to the YWCO lately, not the YMCA, the YWCO. It used to be the Rock Church. I drove by it last week. It's the same church I was in. 38 years ago. You know what is, what's down there? Elwood Park? You, you know, that's the nicest park in Amherst. It's a mess. It's a mess. 
It's where all the homeless sleep. They still sleep there. I drove around the building and I remembered how I would walk there because what that building, or the, the house we had, West Lep, the all pink house, I could walk from that house to that church. It was a mess. It was a glorious mess. It was so much fun. Well, you would have been in danger. We're in danger all the time. Are you kidding me? All the time. What'd you do after that? We were there seven years and we went up to the boulevard. It was kind of a mess when we got there and then we fixed it up so clean, so nice, nothing ever happened. Nothing happened at that church. Do you know why? Because we were in the suburbs. Everything was nice and neat and clean and white and boom. I need a mess. I need a messy church. I need to where anybody, any shape, any color, any background can walk into this building and we can give them Jesus. That doesn't mean anybody can walk in here and do anything. Don't, don't misunderstand. But it does mean anybody can walk in here. And look at all the oxes we have here tonight. What do you expect us to do? Help us kind of clean up the mess. There's always messes. What one? Oh, the poo-poo. <laughs> really? Sometimes, yeah, you'd be surprised where we find it. <laughs> but where we expect it, where we expect it is in our nursery. I thought of a joke. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the joke. It's all your fault, CJ. You got your... <laughs> in the nursery. Asher, probably right now. It, it's great having that. Somebody has to clean it up. Better to have the kids and messes. You, what, you think tree house is always, you know, in order and clean? Your kids are crazy. They make messes everywhere. That's great. Better to have the kids in the mess. And the, so I'm not saying, you know, there's a balance to this. So I need to move on. But I love the verse. I'll still quote it. But here's where you can help. Don't use that verse as an excuse to make her job harder. Clean up your own mess. And speaking only to the men, only to the men, would you just flush the urinal? You know, you know, come on, guys. Come on. I know you ladies don't have that problem, but I'm embarrassed that my sisters have to go in and say, look what the ox is left here today. So... Okay, I think I got all I can get out of that verse. I still love the verse. And I praise God, I praise God, I praise God for a messy church that ministers to people all across the board and will keep cleaning up the mess. Verse five, a faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. I just had to think of Acts 1.8. Can I see Acts 1.8 real quick? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. We're gonna see that verse partially fulfilled on Sunday right there. But when you say a witness, you just don't wanna lie about what you know about Jesus. To be a witness, be empowered by the Spirit and just tell people what you know about Jesus. Be truthful about it. You don't have to, Ramp him up. Just tell people what he did for you. A faithful witness does not lie. Verse 6. A scoffer, somebody who's really cynical, a scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it. The scoffer seeks wisdom, but he doesn't find it. But knowledge is easy to him who understands. You know, if you're cynical of the Lord, if you're cynical of things, cynical of situation, and, think, and you think you're going to find wisdom, it ain't going to happen. You're, you're blind to it. The Holy Spirit can't minister to you. The Word's not going to minister. Jesus is going to minister to you. You don't want to be the scoffer. But knowledge is easy. Can I hear you say easy? easy. It's not hard to get knowledge from the Lord. It's not hard. If your eyes are open... If the Holy Spirit's within, if you open up this book and say, Lord, just speak to me. It's not hard, it's easy. That's what it says, knowledge is easy to him who understands. 
Understands what? We understand Jesus. You need Jesus. Once you have him, even Jesus said, can I see Matthew 7, 7? Jesus said this, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. Amen for that? It's not hard. Unless you're cynical. Unless you're a scoffer. Then you're not going to get it. But it's easy to him who understands. And I would say that we understand Jesus. We know Jesus. Verse 7, in the same context of that, it says, Go from the presence of a foolish man. Can I hear you say go? Well, I just like hanging around this guy. No, go. Go. Go from the presence of a foolish man. When you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge... When should I leave a foolish man? When you perceive. He doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. He doesn't have anything on his lips. None none of his words. He he doesn't have knowledge. He's full of himself. He's a foolish man. What are we supposed to do with foolish men? Go from them. Leave them. And I could say women. You say, what are you talking about? Probably a lot of the stuff on social media, you need to go. You need to leave. Oh, but I love Facebook. Stop it unless they're very knowledgeable people, but if they're a bunch of fools that you're listening to, what are you listening to it for? Go. You can insert how that applies. You don't want to be in the presence of a foolish man. Stop it. That's another way to say it. Just stop it. Can I hear what Ross has to say on that quote? Ross. One cannot increase in knowledge by associating with a fool. Don't miss that. One cannot increase in knowledge by associating with a fool. Nothing comes from nothing, as many can affirm. You're wasting your time. Verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But folly of fools is deceit. It might be popular, the folly of fools. But wisdom of the prudent, I want to be the prudent man, is to understand his way. If you are prudent, if you're wise, then you think about the way you're on in Jesus. You think about the way you're following him. You seek to understand your way. Am I on the right path? Is the Holy Spirit in charge of my life? What am I doing? What am I saying? Who am I? I, It's good to just almost daily take him to, are you on the right path? Is this the path God wants you on. You say, well, I'm in Jesus. Oh, great. Are you following him? Are you speaking for him? Are you prudent? Do you think about that? Can I see the quote by Poole, please? It consists not in vain speculations, nor in a curious prying into other men's matters, nor in cunning arts of deceiving others, but in a diligent study of my own duty and of the way to true and eternal happiness. Translated, I try to examine my life. Lord, Lord, am I messing up? Am I saying too much? Am I thinking the right things? Am I doing the right things? And you say, when do you do that? All the time. A prudent man examines his own way. You sure don't want to assume it. You sure don't want to be like, well, I'm just going to be the same as I've always been. Whoa, 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 whoa. What, what I found in the Lord, you never get through examining like, okay, is this right? Is this right? You don't want to be the same old, same old you were a year ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. He's out to sanctify you. And the more you cooperate, so you never get kind of like, 
And you say, what are you talking about? I've been up since like four o'clock this morning thinking, huh, huh. I think I need, yeah, yeah, you're right, Lord. I need to get back. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Amen. Are you guys having fun tonight? Are you thinking? What is it? The way of wisdom as we're in the way with Jesus. And how can I, co- how can I cooperate better? And not get caught up in all of the foolishness everywhere about everything that you can imagine. Verse 9. Fools mock at sin. Fools mock at sin. But among the upright, there is favor. The heart knows its own bitterness. The heart knows its own bitterness. And a stranger does not share its joy. It's interesting on that quote there, or that verse, verse 10. The heart knows its own bitterness. A stranger does not share that heart's joy. It's personal. It's personal. And there's things that happen in our hearts. There's things that happen in, in our lives that bring joy. Spurgeon, can I see the first quote on Spurgeon? And I like that he tagged um, Job on this. We're reading Job in our scripture right now. We may not judge, we may not judge our brethren, though we understand them and we're competent to give a verdict upon them. Do not sit down like Job's friends and condemn the innocent. You don't know their heart. You don't know why they're upset. You don't know what they're going through. But they know. They know. And right now there'd be, there'd be a lot of hearts in this room right now, right? Hearts in this room right now. And they're full of hardship and disappointment. Using the word bitterness in the right context. They didn't think life would work out this way. What are they to do? Be careful not to judge them because at the same time, a stranger does not share in its joy. There's also people in the room, their, their hearts are overflowed with joy. It was like, I was really scared and my heart was getting, and then all of a sudden God answered that, God answered that for me. Some of you need to, do you, do you still have joy in your heart? Don't let that bitterness overwhelm your joy. Trust the Lord that got you to this point. What are you talking about? Hey, are your sins forgiven? Do you know that your sins are forgiven in Jesus? I just gave myself goosebumps. You know why I gave myself goosebumps? All the way down. Do you know why? Because I remember when I first got saved, the first thing that brought joy to my heart, my sins are forgiven. Because I'm a bad sinner and, and they were forgiven and that produced joy in me. Can I remind you that we're all going to heaven. If you're in Jesus, we're going to heaven. Hopefully sooner instead of later, that should bring joy. Well, if you only knew, okay, I'm not going to focus on that. I want to bring my heart back in. And when's the last time God answered a prayer for you? Well, he hasn't answered my prayer. When's the last time? your heart was heavy. And last week was a a heavy, heavy week for me. Lots of things going on. It was heavy. It was heavy. And then I got the phone call. On top of all this stuff, my son Andrew pulled a muscle. Only he got on YouTube and figured out, watched all the guys, I'm going to die. Not quite that bad, but he... he, (laughs) And so he's crying. And, and you know that thing? Now, my son's 42 years old. Like, son, 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 son. Don't listen to everything they say on you. You want to tell? But he's, he's already over the edge. He's already over. He's crying with his dad. Like, this is it. I know my son. He's in Virginia. So I'm driving. This. You have to think through this and write it there. Nobody knows the heaviness in my heart. You don't know the heaviness for my son in my heart. And so how do I help him? From where I'm at. And I said, go find your sister. <laughs> and they were having a party with some friends from California. So Andrew went, to make a long story short, the guy that was there was a firefighter. He got all this medical stuff. And he checked out Andrew and said, you probably need to go to the emergency care center. So then Andrew has to drive 45. I'm telling you all this because daddy, papa, is, is worried about his son. I, I, I want to be there. I'm praying with him. I'm crying with him. Lord, heal him. He got to the urgent care center. And they said, uh-oh. And Andrew, and, you know, anyways, it, just, it, was, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. But they found somebody to make a long story short. He pulled a muscle. He's not going to be crippled. He's not paralyzed. 
here's some Tylenol 3. And when he got, when he got back, do you know what happened in my heart? Because all the pressures and all the problems are still there. But that one part, it was the tipping point. It was the tipping point. Like, Lord, please. And joy. In spite of all the other stuff, joy. That my son's okay. So the next day, I'm talking with him again. He's still worried what he saw on one of the YouTube. Stop, 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 stop. stop. You're okay. God healed you. Let's rejoice in that. See, you can't judge why people's hearts are out of whack. You can't. Nor can you appreciate the joy that God puts in them. It, what, what about your heart? What about your joy? Amen. Verse 11. The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. A lot of people with a lot of really big houses, but they're wicked. Well, that house is not going to stand up against the judgment. Whether you're talking about a physical mansion or you're talking about some guy's life, it'll be overthrown. Oh, but the tent, this little tent of the upright will flourish. I'll show you that verse in just a moment. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We've already talked about that. It's very, very deceptive, and the world lives under that lie. Amen, that we have the Holy Spirit and that we have Jesus. Amen? Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow. Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow. And the end of mirth may be grief. A lot of people laugh, a lot of people entertain, a lot of laughter going on, but they're not happy at all. They're not happy at all. By the way, just an extra thing. Be careful what you laugh at. Be careful at what makes you laugh. There is a lot of good, healthy laughter. But a lot of it turns sinful real quick. Be careful what you laugh at. The backslider, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. But a good man will be satisfied from above. You don't want to be the backslider you want to be satisfied from above, the good man. Notice it says the backslider in heart will be filled in his own ways. He's in the wrong way. He is. Spurgeon has a quote about the backslider, and I like this. I saw this today. The first part of his name is backslider. He's not a back runner nor back leaper, but a backslider. That is to say, he slides back with an easy, effortless motion, softly, quietly, perhaps unsuspected by himself or anybody else. Don't be that guy. Don't be that woman. Be righteous. Verse 15. The simple believe every word. The simple, they lack wisdom, believes every word word. I saw it on YouTube. It must be true. I read it on Google. It must be true. My friend posted it on Facebook. It must be true. The simple believes every word. But the prudent considers well his steps. A wise man fears and departs. Can I hear you say departs? departs? A wise man not only fears but departs from evil. But a fool rages and is self-confident. You want to catch it early. When things start to turn evil, you want to depart. I don't care if it's social media, 
television show, music, friends. When it starts to go evil, it's time to leave. If you're a wise man. Yeah, but I bought the ticket to the movie. I was just into this six-part series and so-and-so recommended it. I ain't so-and-so. It's me and my God. You know what I've noticed over the years? The filter gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more holy, more holy, more holy. And I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about, you know, sticking your head in the sand. And, but <clears throat> when you enter into entertainment and then you participate in the entertainment, be very careful that it's not evil. So I can watch a lot of shows. I can watch a lot of shows. And if it's, you know, real life, war, whatever, and, and stuff, even with the language, okay, I, I get it. I don't want to be, you know, something like, oh, don't tell me that. No, I, I, I can actually watch that and learn. But when somebody gets up and he wants to tell a joke and all of a sudden you want me to laugh with you on that? Now I'm entering, I'm entering into your world. Is that, am I communicating here? Or all of a sudden it starts to go sideways and wait, wait, wait. You're not just portraying something that happened. You're now wanting me to go down that road. I don't think I want to go down that road. So I don't expect you to go by my standards. I expect you to go by the standards that God gives to you. And so when the book that you are so engrossed in, but then all of a sudden it goes sideways. Yeah, but I want to know how it ends. <laughs> Maybe you don't. I can tell you're thinking, I'm not the Holy Spirit. But I do want to have peace in my own heart. What it said, well, the wise man fears and departs. Turn it off, leave, shut it down from evil. But a fool rages and is self-confident. I don't want to be that guy. Verse 17, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. <laughs> Verse 17, that's not fair, Lord. You're looking at a quick-tempered man. Do I hear an amen from my brother? But not like I used to be. Man, I think of some of the times when I've lost my temper. It was a long time ago, yesterday. No. <laughs> you, you know, something's not right when somebody ticks you off in your blazer and I stop on George's street and I'm out of the blazer. I'm out of the blazer. And my wife is in there holding our babies. I don't care. It's on. Or you show up at a business and you quick tempered over what? You know what's really bad about that? When you have to repent and you have to go back to the world and say, you know, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a pastor and I was wrong. You bet you were wrong. I know I was wrong. It's really hard for me. Maybe you have no problem with your temper. But Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the word can overcome that. Can. Quick-tempered man acts foolishly. Oh, Lord. Amen for your grace. A man of wicked intentions is hated. That's a different category. A man of wicked intentions is hated. I don't ever want to be that guy. Ever. Or the quick-tempered guy. Uh, verse 18. The simple inherit folly. That's what they get. But the prudent, the wise, are crowned with knowledge. Can I hear an amen? amen? Last verse. The evil will bow before the good. The evil will bow before the good. And the wicked 
at the gates of righteousness. Man, we're in the way of Jesus. We're following him. Maybe you don't feel it, but we're joint heirs of Christ. We're empowered with the Holy Spirit. We're adopted as children into his family. We're kingdom kids. We are destined in him to reign and rule with him. You probably haven't thought about that today. But this verse makes it sound like somehow evil will bow before the good. You, you know that from the Old Testament, remember? Joseph's story. All the things that happened about, you know, around Joseph and the things that happened around Jesus. And tell me, let me make sure I get the, can I see 1 Corinthians 6? This is 1 Corinthians 6. This is the Corinthian church. And they had a lot of oxes in their church. They had a lot of messes in their church. But to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 6, it says, do you not know, my friends at Grace Church tonight, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Don't you know that? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know, Grace Church, that we shall judge angels? Now, when's the last time you thought about that? Well, no, I'm just a nobody. You're not a nobody. You're a child of the king. We're headed for a kingdom. We're headed for a new heaven and a new earth. And somewhere down that path, you're going to be on the bench, so to speak. And people are going to come before you. You're going to help judge the world. And angels. Is that what it says? Is that in the right context of the church? Is it like the best church ever? It's the Corinthian church. We forget who we are. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Hey, come on, guys, figure it out. You don't have to always sue everybody and take it to court. I'll get my way. Figure it out. We're going to judge the world and judge the angels. You feel better now? I'm not sure you feel better. I do. I do. Because I know I'm in the way, the truth, and the life. And he is so patient and so gracious. New mercies every morning. And the more you cooperate with that, the more you think about it, the world's still going to be the world. Problems are still going to be the problems but you don't have to be caught up in it. You can actually walk through this place looking like Jesus by his grace, his word, his spirit, and your cooperation. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word today. I thank you for a messy church with Messy people and lots of ideas, lots of outreaches, lots of things. But the bottom line, anybody can come. Our message has stayed intact for like 38, going on 39 years now. Your word has been sufficient. Your spirit has been so good. And Jesus, you're still calling people to yourself. Thank you that you didn't give up on me. Thank you that the Holy Spirit's still working in me and my friends. Thank you for Wednesday night. Help us not to be the fool, but to be wise. Help us to know when to go, when to stop, when to depart. And give us, Lord, the extra dose of your spirit to make some really hard decisions sometimes. At the same hand, Lord, remind us how there's miracles happening every day, and you healed my son, Andrew, and I thank you for that. Thank you for my dear wife, Lord, and all the ways that she has beautified a house into a home. 
Thank you for all my sisters here tonight. And Lord, uh, just the beauty that you give to them. And my, my brothers, Lord, and I'm not alone. So often it feels like we're in this huge fight that we'll never be able to win. And yet in Jesus Christ, we already have. So give us wisdom. Let's be careful with our words and just follow Jesus. Could be you're here tonight and you've never ever made that decision. This would be a great night. You've been in your way, your truth, your life. It's not gonna work. You already know that. And Jesus invites you to himself to follow Jesus, the way, the truth. But you have to make that decision to be in his life. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to stand. If there's anybody tonight, you just say, I just want to follow Jesus. Somehow I need Jesus. I need to be connected to him. Just by standing. If, if that's you, I'll just pray real quick and then we're done. You want to make that decision to follow the Lord tonight. Is there anybody? I thank you, Lord. Bless my friends. We do rejoice in our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.